Hey everybody, welcome back. Well, the S&P 500 hanging right in here today. You wouldn't think that by the activity. I just want to show you this. This is something that I always pay attention to when we start to have these pullbacks. It's an Ichimoku cloud, and this is just very quickly the cloud. I did a video on this a long time ago. It's one of the first videos I actually ever did for this channel. But when you get in here, think of it like quicksand. So you never really want to be in the cloud because that's kind of how it acts. We've come down to that level and we've held, and now we're trying to ride that level up. But if we look at something a little more simplistic that people are used to, you'll see that 55 holding there. I use a 12, a 22, and a 55. And you can see the acceleration of selling. And we're going to talk about why the selling accelerated in some detail. But first, we have a couple things to go over here that I think are really important. Number one, we have to go through an indicator that no one's really paying attention to that I would strongly suggest that you pay attention to. Number two, just in regards to Bitcoin, I want to go through some of these highlights for you. There's very, very little for people to do here. You're just very simply in a trading range. And I don't think the overreaction or even refer to it as underreaction to the recent conference is anything for us to concern ourselves with. But when it comes to the NQ, the NASDAQ here, we're going to have to spend a little time with it because you're getting some really mixed reviews here. Now, by mixed reviews, we have Microsoft that's down more than it's ever been down in about 10 years after hours. We have AMD at the time of recording this. You are up. Whew, you're up a good $10 right now. So you have some major moves. I don't think the last time we ever saw Microsoft down a solid 30 points after hours. We're going to have to talk about this move and why it happened and why it actually bounced back. Uh, should it have done this? Should it have not? We're going to go into the earnings. You do have some odd highlights with Starbucks after hours, the Elliott management. We have to go through that as well. But before we get there, we have to talk about the driving force and what's going on here. Because a lot of people are not really understanding why the market's dropping the way that it is. But let's go through just again the basics. We are in what we refer to as what? Quicksand. What you don't want to do here is we do not want to come out on the other side of quicksand. Now, I gave a couple real quick, quick indicators the other day, and we're going to just cover them again very quickly here. You see how you're under this, and then you bounce through it, under and bounce through it, under and bounce through it. And that's where you saw the majority of the move, under and then bounce through it. That's what you want to look at. Uh, I can't stress how important this is. So we always want to use these as guardrails, but one of the key things that we did go over and let's go to the RTY before we go forward. You can see the difference here on the cloud, and we can just see the difference here very quickly by looking at the moving averages. Okay, so what gives? Why are we seeing three different markets? I'm going to give you my example here in a moment. I'm going to give you one indicator that you really need to start watching that a lot of people are not really paying attention to. And you're going to get something pretty finite on it this evening, and we're going to discuss that. You'll know by tomorrow morning, actually. So let's, let's get into that. But first, we talked about the VIX, and we talked about how the VIX was acting. So if we take a look here, here's what always concerns me about things like the VIX. High, high, high. Right, this all marked the lows. Now, when I say marked the lows, I go on the assumption that people know that when this peaks, that the S&P marks the low. So we're just gonna go through that so you can see the peak here, and here's the S&P. Peak, S&P, peak, and this is where you're at. I think we have to get to this 21 level, but a lot of people don't really know that the NASDAQ 100 has one of their own, and they aren't aware of that, that even RTY has one of their own. So when we come here and take a look, and we see that we are at a higher high here, and we are here, and we have an undercut here. There is always the rub of, do we have to undercut here? I would say no. What I always say to this is, on a percentage basis, you probably have to drop more than this drop, is the way that I always look at it. And I think that's a fair assessment to say that that's already happened. And I think anyone would agree with that. But again, you see these peaks, and those peaks are reflective here, over and over again. Let's show that again. We can see that peak here, right? And how it goes. All right. This is really important to get because of what I'm going to show next. Now, you guys, if you watch Saturdays, and I'll link Saturday's video at the end, what do you think about me making clips out of Saturday's video and then re-showing parts of that uh, at the end, like five or seven minute clips? Comment on that because Saturday's video is like 50 minutes long for those that don't know. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking about clipping out pieces of it and then reposting those pieces when I think that there's something pertinent in there. Because not everybody can go through a you know 50 minute video and then go, oh yeah, where was that thing? But I could always link it at the end of this or repost it. So let's get into what you're supposed to be paying attention to. But comment on that, if that would be helpful to clip those out and send them. What I don't wanna do is just keep putting stuff out there and you're just like, well, you already saw this. But anyway, just let me know. VIX, three month divided by the VIX. And what this tells you is how fast we're dropping. And what gets me about this is, this will easily mark any low. 
And you can see here you are in October, you can see where you are now, and you can see where you are here. My problem with this is we're not getting that panic. And this is what I went over on Saturday. If we look at the put call ratio right here, you will see you're starting to get a little bit of panic. But when you had this move on April 19th and you start looking at it, you had way more buying. 144 in November, if you go there, everybody was scared to death. 162. We hardly have any protective buying, meaning that, that we don't have any put buying. And this becomes a concern. This is where it starts getting interesting. And this is why I always talk about the stool. Because what people don't understand here is is this a macro issue that's affecting us? Is this a fundamental issue that's affecting us? Or is this a technical issue? Well, I would argue that it's macro, but not in the way that you think, meaning it's really not predicated upon what the US is doing so much. Is it a fundamental issue? To some extent, it might affect debt service, but is it technical? Yes, it's definitely a technical issue. But what we're gonna talk about here is something that most people are really not paying attention to. And it's not something the US can do a whole heck of a lot about. And what I'm referring to is I'm referring to the U.S. dollar versus the yen. There's very little that the U.S. can really do about this. There's some things, but if Japan wants to act, Japan wants to act. Take a look at this, and then we're going to cover some names so that we can be prepped for tomorrow. But this is going to happen this evening, and this can dramatically affect the market. Take a look. The number one indicator you need to be watching right now, and a lot of people are not, is the U.S. dollar's relationship to the Japanese yen. And a lot of people don't watch this for a whole list of reasons. But as always, I stress macro, fundamentals, and tech. And there is a time when you should really be paying attention to this. For those who've been following these videos, if last year, you remember in July in 23, when they talked about raising rates back then, some of the issues that we saw with this particular trade back then too, for technology. And we can see that it's following in tandem. Now, what's nice about this is there's a macro event that's actually leading to this. So if you have a macro event, it makes your life a lot easier. Why? Because if you look at the macro event, you can just see, oh, okay, well, when something happens, this is going to do this. And if this is going to do this based upon a macro event, then we know to look out for what? The macro event. And we're gonna to get to that in a moment. But I want you to understand the relationship. So if you look at the US dollar versus the Japanese yen, and we're gonna get into why this is important, you can see very clearly here that the NASDAQ is just following it in lockstep. Also, all of this is following one key data point. And if you go to this data point, you will realize that that is July 11th at 8.30, which is when we had our first negative CPI. So we are going through disinflation. Japan is going through inflation. We are going through disinflation, meaning our economy is dropping in inflation, whereas Japan is going through inflation. What does someone that goes through inflation do? They raise rates, which throws off the balance of power here. And the question that most people are going to ask, because you're not going to be familiar with it. It's not something that you would watch unless you trade these. Why, why does this happen and, and how does it affect us? Let's go through a couple quick things. To start, it will affect higher beta names faster. In other words, this is overlaying the ES and it will affect the tech, the globalization names faster. Why? They are more pegged and they are more interest rate and dollar sensitive. So they're going to get affected the most. Technology is obviously more global. They are more impacted by these kinds of moves. They are more impacted by anything dealing with any kind of hedge or inflation risk due to currency risk. We've seen this several times with Microsoft and, and what can happen with their currency exposure with any globalization of company. So it's usually tech that bears the brunt of this. And what you can see is obviously the ES is dropping, but as the ES drops, there's a couple other things that will, will benefit the ES because you have defensive positions here and you could even make an argument for commodities. For example, we were trying to figure out why gold was having such a bid to it, but if you take a look again at that July 11th timeframe, at the same time the US dollar versus the yen is collapsing, what's happening? They're buying gold. Well, they're doing this as a head. There's a couple of reasons for this, and when we get into some of the, match, the, the, the matching here, I guess is the best way to explain to their comparison on why they sell the yen and buy the dollar. Right now, well, I'll show you why in a, in a second. It's not really that hard to understand why, but we're gonna go through it. Just remember, we're going through disinflation, they're going through inflation. You know what we did, and so you don't understand, well, why, why gold's gonna rally and why this is so important right now in a moment, but is this going to lead to all commodities rallying? And the answer is no. What you tend to find is that you have a very high correlation just to oil. Now we are seeing oil names, you see crude down here, but we are seeing the crude oil names, certain ones rally the exploration names, and there's different reasons for that. We can get into that in a little bit here. But what are we seeing here? We're seeing a high correlation to the US dollar yen trade 
And we're seeing that in relation to crude, despite all the uncertainty we have going on in the world. All right, so I try not to get too into this because sometimes it can get a little too correlated. And I'll just talk about the equity risk premium, which we'll do on Saturday and some other things. But so it would affect all the stock markets the same, right? No, it will not. It will actually benefit something like RTY. Okay, so up here is RTY or small caps versus with what? What happened with the US dollar first Japan, Japan and, or the yen rather? And then again, when did this happen? July 11th, right here at 8.30. We know why the CPI went negative. Okay, so why would this actually rally if this is going to do this? Because we, when you have small cap companies, they are not globalization companies. They are not tied to all these different currencies. They don't have the same kind of carry risk or currency risk. They are, their risk is here. For example, if you think about a regional bank, how much risk does a regional bank or a home builder have to the Japanese yen? Not a lot. How much risk does Apple have to the yen? A lot. And this in, this in turn becomes the problem and then affects the names. But let's start talking about the inner working so you can understand why this is so important, why it's so important right now. Now, this is an article directly from someone that focuses specifically on what's going on in Japan. And you can see the timestamp on the article right here. And Bank of Japan will discuss increasing the policy rate 25 basis points at its two day policy meeting through July 31st. And we know exactly where we are right now on the time, don't we? All right, and we know that they're ahead. Okay, so we know we know exactly where we're at time-wise. And we know that we are going through what? Say it with me, disinflation. And they are going through what? inflation. We know that they will raise rates where we will cut rates. Important concept to get for what we're about to go through next. The Bank of Japan is considering raising the policy interest rate, likely 25 basis points, meeting that concludes on Wednesday. Another step towards normalization of monetary policy as wages and prices rise. Central banks look to decide how much and how fast to reduce its monthly purchase of Japanese government bonds. So right now they are out there, they are buying bonds, no different than when j got all greedy and wanted all the bonds and all the mortgages in 2021, with market watchers seeing a cut in half to 3 trillion yen, 20 billion by the end of 25 as likely. Short-term interest rates have remained at zero. This is also important for what we're about to go through next. Rem reminder, they're borrowing at zero, even after the, the BOJ, Bank of Japan, ended its negative interest rate policy in March. A quarter point hike would bring policy back to December 2008, global financial crisis. Okay, all of a sudden it's gonna cost money to borrow things, right? It does not cost money to borrow anything over there, right? Whether you have a bond or you have their currency. And that's an important concept to get for what we're about to go through next and why this is moving our markets. Some policy board members have argued rates need to be raised soon as inflation continues, 2% target. Consumer price index volatile, fresh foods 2.6, marking 27 consecutive months above 2%. We, we would die for these numbers. Japan Finance Minister Cabinet Office will also participate in the meeting and is expected to accept the rate hike if the board goes that route. Why do you care? So I took this specifically from a website called Investopedia because they gave the most basic way to look at this. If you care about this, just go to investopedia.com. You can pop right on there and you can pull this up. But now you know why already before we get into this, that small caps benefit, globalization companies that are tied to the end don't benefit. And I, and I walked you through that and stated also why gold would go up, but why crude may come down. All right, we also understand why with this relationship, it could increase the fluctuation of the market. But let's just talk about the mechanisms now. So in other words, you get the concept, but understanding the why is what's important because let's say they have a meeting and they don't do anything. And then all of a sudden this relationship changes course. And you would expect this relationship to change course if they don't do anything. And therefore, while everyone else is floundering, you're like, oh, I watched this guy, he's a YouTuber, and he explained it. Let me go watch that video again. All right. USD, JPY, currency pair trade has traditionally a close relationship with the US Treasury. When yields on Treasury bonds, notes, and bills rise, yield goes higher. The, the yen tends to weaken relative to the dollar. Our yields go higher, meaning they are selling what? Bonds. The yen goes down, the dollar goes up. This is because people can borrow the yen more cheaply to buy higher yielding dollars. Generally, higher interest rates increase the value of a, of a country's currency. Okay, so if they are selling the yen to buy the dollar and then take those dollars and buy treasuries, all of a sudden that trade loses some luster, doesn't it, if they raise rates. 
So let's say that the, you're selling the yen here and all of a sudden you're only able to sell the yen here and your dollar trade before would get you this profit and now your dollar trade would get you this profit. They sell the yen, they buy the dollar and they buy treasuries with it. They sell the yen, they buy the dollar and they buy treasuries with it, okay? Just get the concept. So if they're selling the yen and when they're selling it, they're not getting $110 for selling the yen, I'm just giving you numbers. Now you're getting 105. Well, now it's not as attractive, okay? So you might not want to do it. Therefore, that would unwind the trade and therefore cause equities to move and that unwinding is going to affect the bond market, the stock market, equity risk premium, and everything else associated with it. Welcome to globalization. So this is really important to get because when this moves and if they don't do anything and the NASDAQ goes higher and the ES goes higher because Japan didn't do anything overnight, you'll understand why. Really important to get this. Less increasing interest rates accompanied by lower treasury prices often causes the US dollar to strengthen, right? Which is the exact thing, with the exact opposite. If you increase what? The yen, then the exact opposite is gonna happen. The US dollar versus is gonna drop. Yields defined if interest paid on, on treasury instruments have an inverse relationship with bond prices. We know this. Bonds go, bond prices rally, then yields drop. So if they buy bonds, then the yields on those bonds drop because of demand. If they sell bonds, those yields go higher because of lack of demand. Therefore, when yields slump, a flight to liquidity occurs and this liquidity must find a home, <laughs> well, which is the currencies can become attractive. And this is, this is the rub because this has been the trade forever. However, Japan has maintained a very low interest rate for some time. This has led to the yen status as the premier funding currency the premier funding currency. For example, by selling a lower yielding currency such as the yen, sell the yen. With its current interest rates below major trading partners, UK, US, Canada, et cetera, et cetera, investors can seek higher interest rate instruments with its tra trading partners for carry trade, it's called the carry trade, have been a major funding for, for instance, if you sell the US, Japan for dollars, you can then use those dollars to obtain high yielding in, such as treasury bonds to boost your returns. Sell the yen, buy dollars, by treasuries. All of a sudden, this whole thing unwinds. All of a sudden, this whole thing unwinds if this happens, which makes the equity risk premium of the market switch because if this unwinds and you're no longer gonna have these people buying treasuries because of this carry, then all of a sudden, our yield's gonna go higher. The equity risk premium's gonna go higher. Them cutting interest rates don't have the same effect because other people are doing things as well. And we can get into that at a later date if you would like. But it's really important to get this. And it's really important to understand that this is the number one indicator that people are not watching. We were watching it all day today. And again, to hammer this home, this is Investopedia. You can boost returns if you sell this buy dollars and obtain in instruments. But let me show you how to use this. So today when you're trading or when we're, we're day trading because this, how does this equate to real life? So when we're day trading today, you're starting to see this fall off a cliff. Well, it's, it's, it's lockstep, it's step for step the whole way down. Well, all of a sudden you see this drop. And then when you see this drop here and you correlate that to here, you're like, well, wait a minute. You can see that we drop and then we go a little lower, but this didn't go lower. So this stopped, this went higher, this went lower. And you can see that pretty clearly here, right? Where this was the low, and then that correlates to here, and then that is there, you can, hopefully you can see this. And so once that happens, you're like, oh, wait a minute, we made a higher high here on that little move here, and we didn't do that here until we got over here. And you can see that that's a little further away. So that's that kind of stuff's important. So what you're doing is you're looking for that, and that helps you determine a bottom. And I'll show you why this is helpful. If you look right here at 106 today, I go, look, this is bottoming. We've been, I've been watching it all day when we're in the community. Please excuse my typing because I'm typing fast with my sausage-like fingers and I need a new keyboard. So what I'm doing here is I'm watching this and then I'm going, oh, well, we're bottoming because this <clears throat> is further down than where you are here. And therefore, we're hitting a level that becomes of interest. And you could say, well, I'm not trading this. I just trade stocks. It doesn't matter because what, what you'll start to see is those areas of interest. That, like If we look at this, it really won't matter anymore because you know where that area is. So whether I throw in NVIDIA or Microsoft or whatever name you want to look at, you'll see that they're all right around the same exact area. They've all stopped at the same area and they're all lows at the same exact area. And I think that's really important for people to get here. It's not going to matter what the name is. They're all going to stop at the same exact spot. 
Because once again, this is why we focus on the following, and it's really important for people to get this. You, know, you need to understand the macro, the fundamental, and the technical picture. And when you do understand that, you can make more informed decisions. Does it always work? No. But if you understood that we are dropping because of that carry trade, and that carry trade could be interrupted because they have a, Bank of Japan has a meeting coming up, and they could raise rates, well, all of a sudden, you have a better understanding of what you're supposed to do here, and that gives you an edge over everybody else. Now, I hope you found that helpful. Let's get to these names because there's there's three definitely that we want to talk about here so that you're prepped for tomorrow. AMD after hours, 69 versus 68. Wow, I wish you would really go that way. It'd make my life a lot easier. And that is one big arrow. That's way, way bigger than we're going to need. We're going to have to get rid of that. And I'm not going to have time to edit this. So 69 versus 68, 583 versus 572. Okay, so it reads well. This is what I was not crazy about and I didn't think was really worth it was six, four, seven, and then you're looking at six, six. So if I'm looking at guidance, what are you really guiding here? What are we really saying here at the end of the day? Are we saying that we have something here that we need to really pay attention to? And I'm going to say, no, not really. I, this really isn't great. I mean, what you do is you average these two numbers together and this is the estimate. So you'd go, okay, well, they're basically saying you're at, you know, at what, six, six, seven. Okay. Who cares? It, it's not like they're, they're right in line roughly. It's not like it's that great. Uh, up 115% year over year driven by demand. Okay, the stocks had an enormous move. So I didn't really view it as much. Uh, the guidance was where it was. The margins came in at 53%. I didn't think it was that great. I'm just gonna state that when it first came out and the action wasn't that great when it first came out. Now, after hours, the stock took a different move and we'll talk about why. You have that initial move down and I'm, I'm looking at it and I didn't think it was that great. And then all of a sudden you just start lifting. They mark it here, but it actually came out sooner. And then you just start breaking above that anchored VWAP. Always put an anchored VWAP on that first e that our first earnings bar because it will save you a lot of time and you'll be able to see where everybody's located at. And you can see how we never even got close to it. Then you have the breakout bar right here and that was it. We pulled back. You formed a little flag and then you broke out of it. And then she just kept saying the right things over and over again on the call and the stock kept moving. Now we're grinding up after hours. And of course, you're now aware that really tech depends not on the macro front, not the fundamental front, which would be this leg of the stool, but the macro front, it's really in the hands of Bank of Japan and what they do this evening. I have my belief on that, it doesn't really matter, but uh, it is what it is. We'll play the hand that we're dealt tomorrow. But then you have to deal with the technical side. Well. The technical side is you're oversold. The technical side is people were short and now they're dealing with this. Is this enough to lift us out tomorrow? I don't have an answer to that. And you're gonna find out tomorrow. And I quite frankly think it's more in the hands of the BOJ. But I will say this, on the call, people were positive. And here they were talking about how Microsoft is implementing it into Copilot. And I thought that was very interesting because that was a new development for them. And she hammered home that this was a new development for them and another revenue source. So in other words, we knew that Microsoft was looking at, at diversifying away from NVIDIA just because of supply issues, which again, is really good to hear for NVIDIA purposes. NVIDIA actually went up after hours on this. We'll get to that in a second, but that's why it moved. So I actually think uh, this much I could t tell you on opinion wise, I think the investment banks will be somewhat favorable towards this tomorrow. Where that puts us at four in the morning, depending upon or, you know, off the open, if that's how, when you trade, we'll see, you know, Asia opens, gets access at four o'clock. We'll see what they do with this. But if you take a look at how this played out at first, NVIDIA just absolutely imploded to the downside. And now you're trying to bid up a little bit and because now they're extrapolating out what AMD did and her comments were very bullish. The one thing I will say that they kept hammering over and over again were two words, data center and servers. They're very worried about that stuff. So what you could see here is you could see some of these other movements start to lift, like you're seeing VRT, which obviously is very connected to data servers. You could see those start to move up if they are positive on data servers overnight. You would have to watch that, meaning in the writings overnight, and then see how they act tomorrow. I think that's gonna be very pertinent. Hopefully you followed that. So you wanna see what the investment banks and how they act towards these names. But we did see NVIDIA and we did see NVIDIA act very well. Matter of fact, at the time recording this, uh, NVIDIA is doing exceptionally well. And you know, based upon what I just walked you through earlier, this presented an opportunity even for us today to get in NVIDIA with that USD uh, yen trade, we actually got in here around 105 and, and held into this. So not everybody's going to hold into this, obviously, but I felt we got it cheap enough that it made sense to. And even after hours, I was down for a whopping one minute. But that's going to take us into our, our next suck salad after after hours. And, and that's going to be Microsoft that seems to be getting it together on the call right now. Now, at the time of recording this, I don't know what was said on the call. 
I can only tell you that what you're seeing is you're seeing during the call that we dropped down and now you're seeing the left. Uh, this present, presented an opportunity actually for me to get involved in the stock. When it dropped like this, this is the single greatest drop that you had after hours in at least 10 years. Microsoft does not drop 7% unless, you know, something something massive, massive happens. Um, massive, it just doesn't do that. So when we drop like this, I really didn't care. I'm like, if I could buy Microsoft down 30, I'll do that all day long. It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me. We got down to that 36, 37 level. I was like, okay, I'll just print it. And there's a reason for that. I can walk through it. But if you figure out the average daily volume of the stock and the average true range movement of the stock, and it's a point where this is such an anomaly that the chances of it staying down here are pretty much slim and none. Um, it doesn't mean you're going to rally, but just the mere fact that you're going to keep going lower on a trillion dollar company, it's just not realistic. And what's crazy about it is if you know this stuff, you could actually have marked off and you could see where it just stopped right here. So if you want to know where your support is tomorrow for any reason with this, I mean, just put an alert at 390. You can see that very clearly. That that's definitely your level to watch. What I would say about Microsoft was with, without getting too much fanfare and of not listening to the call, their cloud business came in the high teens, 19%. The estimate was mid to low 20s and the straight high end was like 27%. So this was a huge disappointment. It wasn't the earnings, it wasn't the revenue, it was the cloud beat. That scared what we will refer to as the bejesus out of people and that's why NVIDIA dropped the way that it did. I wanna be clear about that. NVIDIA dropped because of Microsoft and please get the distinction. It did not drop because of AMD. It dropped because of Microsoft. And that's a really important distinction because you'll see other names that fell right out of bed when they saw that. And now they're starting to try to rally back a little bit here. You see like Snow just completely encapsulated. These names just fell off a cliff. And that was because Microsoft's cloud business was down. And that obviously is going to shake names like Oracle. It's going to shake names like CRM, right? I mean, crowd's just basically a dumpster fire floating down the river with a bunch of raccoons, but you know, we'll see what happens with this one. I think this one's in a lot of trouble. Disclosure, I have a short position in this and I bought puts today uh, and I plan on holding them and I already have like a double in them, but I, I think they have a lot of, I think they have a lot of problems. I did scale out of some, but I think they have a lot of problems there. But again, let's just, I don't wanna digress because I wanna to try to keep this shorter for the weekday. If we sit here and take a look here, after hours, you have Starbucks, it missed. Couldn't break that level for it, missed, retest retest, retest. We've seen this before. This is exactly what happened to pins and we'll talk about pins for a second here. And what you're saying here more than anything is that you have a base. You're breaking out after hours. One of the key things that moved after hours, this is what was great about the community because frankly, I was on the AMD call and I couldn't be on that one. Someone else was on the Starbucks call and they're just like, by the way, uh, they're taking Elliott Management's advice. And when you see, when you know what to look for guys, your life gets super easy. And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, okay, you know that you can go long and then this is pretty much your break even. Like if you break that level, you probably wanna get out of it. And so then after hours, you're kind of pushing here, but that's a really good sign and I would look for this to move tomorrow. But your big driving force when you're looking at this and going, okay, are we gonna rally? Is this going to last? To me, it's more in the hands of Bank of Japan than anything else. And of course, you're still gonna have the micro issues of these names. These names are still gonna drive their own fate. If their earnings are fantastic or their dumpster fires, it's not gonna matter as much per name, but the overall move leaves something to be desired. For example, you know, are we gonna see this massive rally in NVIDIA now that Microsoft caught a bid? You know, I don't know the answer to that. What I will say is I will say that at the end of the day, it's holding its own ground, but I do believe that it's still in the hands of Bank of Japan because that's really what controlled the market today. That's it.